Welcome to a Weber on Wednesday program. This is one of our noon programs. During the month of May, the library celebrates not only National Preservation Month and local history, but also local historian Irving Weber. All of you out there, do you know who Irving Weber is? Well, you're going to get to hear me do my Irving Weber speech in any case. So Irving Weber lived his entire life and almost the entire 20th century in Iowa City. His family roots were deep in the beginning of the city as his maternal grandparents his maternal great-grandparents settled in Iowa City in 1839. His paternal grandparents came to town in 1857. They were kind of late to the, to the show. Well, not really. 1857 is still pretty early. You're supposed to laugh at that. That was my <laughs> prompt for you to laugh. <clears throat> Thank you. Irving was born in 1900, the momentous beginning of a new century. He was educated in Iowa City public schools and graduated from the University of Iowa in 1922. He's remembered for many, many things. He was the University of Iowa's first All-American swimmer. And if you have any recollection of swim meets at the field house, he used to ring the, the bell to start the meets. He was the founder of Quality Check Dairies and served as its president until his retirement in 1966. He was an active member of the Iowa City Host Noon Lions Club and was the school board president from 1952 to 1953. In 1994, the Irving B. Weber Elementary School was named in his honor. Weber may be most remembered, at least for us here at the Iowa City Public Library, for, over the, eight, for the over 800 articles he wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen beginning in 1973, long after he had retired from Quality Check. He told what it was like to grow up in Iowa City, the best places to buy penny candy, the joys of cooling off in Melrose Lake in the summer, and of sledding parties on closed off streets. He recorded for future generations the story of Iowa City as no one else could. In 1989, in gratitude for his work in recording local history, Irving B. Weber was named as Iowa City's official historian. And there's a wonderful statue of Irving, if you're not aware of it, on the intersection of Iowa and Lynn. All of the articles Irving Weber wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen are available online at the University of Iowa's digital library through the cooperation of the Iowa City Noon, Iowa City Host Lions Club and the Iowa City Public Library and Lolly Eggers, the retired director of the Iowa City Public Library. In 2006, Lolly Eggers published Iowa City's Irving Weber, a biography, and we have copies of that if you would like to borrow them. And we also have copies of all of Irving's published columns that the Noon, Lion Club, Noon Lions Club put out. And they're kind of a rare item now, so you'll find them at um, garage sales. And I actually have a couple full sets in my office, which I have to guard, because people want them. <laughs> Irving B. Weber died in 1997, barely missing a century of life. Living true to his character, his last days were spent writing and listening to Iowa basketball games on his radio. So today we have, a, I think, a perfect program that Irving would have really, really appreciated and probably could have added a lot of local flavor to it. Alicia Trimble, who is the Executive Director of Friends of Historic Preservation, is going to tell us, give us some guidance and something that I'm really looking forward to because we puzzle over this a lot at the library is how to find out the origins of your house or the secret lives of houses. So I'll turn it over to Alicia. And thank you for coming today. Um, as Maeve said, I'm Alicia Tremble. I'm the Executive Director of Friends of Historic Preservation. Um, I research houses and other buildings in Iowa City a lot for part of my job. And I think when you're researching a house, your motivation is actually quite important uh, to figure out what exactly you're looking for. And when people come to me, I found that there's really three types of motivations for researching their house. There's what I often call the porch problem. And these are people who are generally looking for an old picture of their house more than anything. Uh, these are people who their houses have been changed for some reason or another. For those of you on the Historic Preservation Commission, you see this a lot. Um, but there are a lot of uh, porches that have been removed in Iowa City and towns throughout the United States. Porches. Um, are not structural, so when they're not maintained and they start to fail or rot, sometimes, especially if they're income properties, porches are removed. So a lot of people who actually come to me looking for research are really just looking for that one old picture of their house to either put a porch back, reconfigure their windows to the original design, and so on and so forth. 
The second reason people typically come uh, to me when they want to know about their house is because that they feel that their house has become part of them, or as I usually tell them that you're now part of your house, right? Because your house should outlive you. Uh, you are really just the steward of that home. And people um, with this motivation seem to have the same motivation people do for searching their ancestors, for doing genealogy. They really want to know about the house because it's a key component of who they are today. The third reason people kind of come to me to, to, to do research on their homes is because of a larger community question. And these are often things like um, someone might want to research their home because they're interested um, in Goose Town uh, because of the Bohemian immigration into Iowa City or someone who was a key figure in Iowa City history, or um, maybe famous writer, that happens occasionally in Iowa City, lived in their house, so they wanna know more about their house as part of a greater story for that individual or the community. So um, what you're trying to figure out will kind of dictate where you wanna go and what you wanna look at. Now, I actually had a hard time when I sat down to do this talk. I research houses and buildings all the time in Iowa City. And when I research, my thought pattern is usually, well, is the State Historical Society of Iowa open today? Well, no, because it's hardly open anymore. Uh, you know, is it a weekend? Because if it is, I can't go to the, the um, Johnson County um, Administration Building. But um, when I sat down and thought about it, there are really three things you're doing when you're researching our house. You're researching the actual piece of land. You're researching the building itself, the house itself and you're researching the people who live there. And where you're probably going to find most of your information will actually be by researching the people. And by researching those people, you'll find out more about the house. And I'll talk about that last. But um, that's uh, as counterintuitive as it seems. Sometimes researching the people, people get you a lot farther than actually researching the building itself. Let's see the land. So the first thing I would recommend anyone who's researching their house do is go ahead and find your abstract. Uh, abstracts uh, vary from state to state. Sometimes they're called different things in states and who retains them depends on what state you're in. In Iowa, your property abstract always stays with the property. So if you own that property, you should have that abstract. Um, in fact, you're going to need that abstract if you ever want to sell the property, and if you don't have one, you'll have to have another one made up by a title company. But abstracts are the legal description of everything that's happened to your property. They will tell you things like deeds, mortgages, all court actions taken in regard to your property, um, anything like that. And that, that will give you some very um, formative dates around your property. And also, I find with older abstracts, there's just other pieces of information that happen to slip in there, something about the house, um, and it, it's not, it's just kind of a, a byline in there, but sometimes there's also very good information about the house, even though that's not the point of an abstract. Next, I recommend that uh, people go to the courthouse in their county. Um, there are what are often called deed books, sometimes they're called record of deed books, property transfer books, but they are always kept at a county courthouse or county building of some sort. Um, in Iowa, or excuse me, in Johnson County, they are kept in the county auditor's office. In other counties, they're often in the recorder's office or the assessor's office. But these books are simply a trans, uh, handwritten record of the transfer of properties that are in no order other than probably somewhat in the same date range. They may follow a, follow a date, but even those can get a little mixed up just depending when the person sat down to record the dates. But these actually um, tell us a couple of things. They show us who sold the property, the grantor, who bought the property, the grantee, the date which that transaction happened, and the legal description of the property changing hands. So when you go to your courthouse, and some of you may, this is kind of basic research, so I apologize if some of you already know this, you'll want to go and look for the last person you know bought this house. And in this case, let's say it was Joseph Turner. Then you go and you see who Joseph Turner bought it from. Benjamin Franklin, and this is from Philadelphia. I use this one for a point I'll get to in a minute here. Then next, you are actually going to wanna to go into the grantee line and start looking backwards again, and you wanna find Benjamin Franklin. And then you wanna make sure it's the same legal description for the piece of land, because oftentimes people own multiple pieces of land. Then you wanna find out who they bought it from, and so on and so forth. Um, one thing I did want to point out, and that's why I use this example, is that this says that Joseph Turner 
bought this piece of land from Benjamin Franklin in, on September 5th, 1856. Anybody else got a problem with that? <laughs> Benjamin Franklin died in 1790. So this is, this is why I use this example, actually. There are a couple of things that may have happened. It's not so common in Iowa, but especially further east, they didn't have record of deed books for a very long time, oftentimes until the middle of the 1800s. So oftentimes when people sat down to record this, it was when they sat down and that's the date they wrote it down or that's a best guess date. The other thing that can happen in Iowa and in the Midwest is every courthouse worth its salt has had the obligatory courthouse fire. <laughs> Pretty much every county has had a courthouse burned down and oftentimes the record of deed books went down with that. And sometimes when they recompiled those, depending on who was actually you know, writing the records down. Uh, sometimes it was just the date which they were re-recording it. Other times it was a best guess or they asked someone they thought they might knew and they, it was really more of a generalization. So just so you're aware of that when you're looking at these books. Other things in regard to land are plat maps. Now when you actually go to that record of deed books, you're gonna get a legal description which is gonna tell you the section, range, and township of your property. And this is right here, this is a plat map. And what that will allow you to do is take that legal description, go to this map, and actually see the piece of property. So you can, and I'm, I apologize, I can't read this one, but we could go here and see, okay, well, Joe Smith owned this piece of property. Um, so that's another resource you can look at. They're really fascinating, especially um, if, you, if you have family who uh, settled in a certain area, you can oftentimes see your family names everywhere on them if you're, you're actually uh, from the region you're looking in. The other thing um, that the Sanborn fire insurance maps can kind of fit into buildings or land, I put them here with the rest of the maps, they are the greatest thing that ever happened to historic yeah. preservation. <laughs> um, they are um, exactly what they say they are, they're insurance, they're, they're insurance maps. And these maps tell you um, where the building was, what the building's made of, and what the building was used for. Now, the drawback for these in researching our house is they usually are only around commercial areas. And, um, you know, people didn't tend to live in commercial areas as much. However, especially when you're looking back and towns are smaller, these around here, a lot of these are all houses. And so oftentimes you can find uh, the house if, you live if the house is located closer to a commercial area. This particular map is from 1883. And um, when you find a house, it's usually marked RES, which means residential on these maps. Though there's tons and tons of different um, little abbreviations and you can find, if you just Google it, you can find a key to our Sanborn map uh, on, on the web. Bird's eyes map. Bird, bird's eye maps. These were popular um, after the Civil War. These um, tend to be pretty accurate, and you can oftentimes get an idea by looking at these. I don't want to overstate their importance, though. You can generally, if, if a house is on there, there generally was a house there, but you can't tell the detail. And more importantly, if you're doing a site inventory form or anything official, this is viewed as an artist's rendering. So it's not something, say you're trying to become a, a local landmark or a, a National Register landmark, you can't use this as proof. However, when doing your own research, it really helps to know if a building was already there in 1868, which is when this map was drawn. A number of different cities had these. They were just kind of the, the popular thing. Um, I suppose since you know there were no airplanes, this is really a, an incredible way to think about looking at the land at the time. And I wanna briefly talk about this map. This is, um, just because it's come up a lot lately, and this is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful idea. It's a great map. It is not 100% accurate yet. Um, county assessors are, well, well, let's put it this way. Um, besides the obligatory courthouse fires, oftentimes assessors' offices didn't exist until just prior to World War II. So when they went in and they actually started putting dates on assessor sites, like I'm sure you have all gone, and if you're, if you're interested in this, looked up your own house on the assessor site, it'll tell you what date it was built. If you have a house built probably before 1920, there's a really good chance it says 1900. And that just means it's old. Um, that meant that the person filling out the data didn't have that information. Um, and in this case, um, downtown is all very old. There's some newer buildings in there, of course. So when you look at this map online, um, it's by Mark Pooley. It's a great map, but 
most of the downtown area does not populate until 1900, which is not correct. Just so you're aware that that's there. Uh, Josh Mo, who's here tonight, has been in contact with Mr. Pooley and our, our organization's volunteering, I think, to get some dates together so we can, so we can uh, have a map that has better dates on it. Just so you're aware, if you see this map come up a lot lately, it's a wonderful, wonderful map. It's just not totally accurate right now. Okay. And then there are also county and property tax roll, or excuse me, county tax uh, tax rolls, and sometimes called assessment rolls. These um, oftentimes have valuable information um, in varying forms. This is a common kind of format for an, an assess uh, an assessment roll. Now, what it'll say, oftentimes it's a property being taxed, and there's not much information on an assessment roll. But if you look at year after year after year, you can see if your property taxes are three times what they were the year before, that's often a good indicator that a structure was built on that property during that time. It gives you a place to start again. Other assessment rolls do have little kind of check marks or, or uh, little places to put numbers, as you can see in here. And some of those things will ask if there's a dwelling, you know, what are we taxing? How many cows do you have? Because you're taxed for your cows and your pigs and your horses. It really depends on uh, what county you are in, what state you are in, uh, if those things were taxed. Um, the oldest Johnson County property tax rolls are at the State Historical Society of Iowa here in town on the corner of Gilbert and Iowa. Um, they are actually in the basement, so you have to talk to a staff member and have them get them for you. But they're really, really valuable pieces of information. I've used them before, and they're quite informative. It, it really kind of gives you a snapshot into everyone's life who was living there as well. Now, the building. Um, I recommend when um, you start to look at architecture, you go get yourself, this is my favorite book, but it's Field Guide to American Homes by Lee and Virginia McAllister. But there are a number of these different books. And they, um, I've got some up here, some different varying ones. These um, just kind of give you a brief overview of architecture and when architecture was used. You can also find this information online. But architecture is going to tell you three things um, when you're looking at historic preservation. Very basically, it's going to tell you the economic resources of the person who built that building, or who actually lived in that house, I should say. Um, very wealthy people tended to build bigger houses. Uh, people who weren't so wealthy tended to have smaller houses. That one might be obvious. Uh, architecture is also based on materials available. Um, not all items were invented or, or available in certain regions at the same time. And it also gives you a window when your house could have been built. Um, though architectural styles are popular for a time, they do, uh, they do, you know, tend to, you know, even if Tudor's out of style, someone's going to build a Tudor house later. So it's just a best guess. Uh, this is uh, Butler's Capital, and this is uh, a building that was built in Iowa City uh, right around uh, the founding of Iowa City. This is actually after it had been moved. This, there was no picture of it in its first location. This is uh, a log cabin type building. Um, as one of the first things built in Iowa City, there was no transportation here. There were no real roads here. There were no there was no service via river. There were no train tracks. So you know, the legislature legislators pointed you know kind of west and said to Chauncey Swan, "There's this town called, called Napoleon. Go get make a city called Iowa City there." And so the first people who came out really didn't have anything but their tools, which they brought for survival. Everybody has an axe. You can build a log cabin. So that's oftentimes why you see these um, types of buildings in areas where there are timber first. You literally need an axe, some logs, and uh, chinking mud, basically, um, to, to put one together. Also, what's going on in your city be, can be, be very relevant at the time. Um, the one of the first things that happened in Iowa City is they started to build the old capital. And because of that, there was a lot of cut limestone in town, and there were a lot of people who knew how to work with that stone. And so some of the oldest houses in Iowa City tend to be um, made of limestone. This is a Jacob Wentz house um, here. This is uh, now the Haunted Bookshop. It's being lovingly maintained by the people who own it. It's just wonderful. And this is the house here, and I'll talk about this a bit later. This is at 518 uh, College Street, Helen and Kevin Burford's house. And if you see back here, this bottom section right here, is a, is a stone house. Later in the 1880s, this brick house was built around it. Also, nails. 
Um, there are basically three types of nails. Um, the first type of nail are hand wrought nails. If you find a house full of these in Iowa City, we need to go on TV. <laughs> these, these kind of were, these weren't made much after uh, the turn of the uh, 19th century. These were actually made by blacksmiths, or sometimes called nailers. These were made individually, hand by hand. They were expensive, they were labor intensive. Um, so you didn't really have nails used a whole lot uh, before um, the advent of what are called cut nails. And this is one here, it's a bar of iron. And it gave them a way to pro mass produce nails quicker. These were used in Iowa City until around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and then you move on to wire nails. Um, which look just like nails today. Um, so if you're, if you're wondering how old your house is, these types of things can be indicators, as well as, um, oh, sorry, I was gonna point this out too. This is actually this nail. Um, material reuse was very common before World War II. You know, as, some, as an organization that runs a salvage barn, we're really into promoting this. But back when you had to make everything by hand, people didn't throw things away and they built things to last. So this is actually the salvage we were doing on the other UAY house, which Friends of Historic Preservation wasn't able to move. Um, this is the stairway. And when I took off the railing and the trim and, and the molding on the stairway, I um, took a look at the stairway and I said, that's not right. This house was built you know, after the turn of the century. Everything else in it had wired nails, but they had reused the staircase from someplace else. So be aware, you could have, you could have components of older things in your house house. Um, yes. And then I'm going to go through a few older architectural styles which are found in Iowa City. Um, some of these, um, just so you're aware, I want to make the point that something can be considered, say, Greek, re Greek revival, but look very different from something else that's Greek revival. And these can change throughout times with modifications or subtractions to houses. Um, so this uh, Greek revival was popular in the United States through about the 1860s. This is actually the Irish Hamilton Turner house here. Uh, a log cabin is originally in this house. No one ever knows if it actually had this mansard roof. What it, it looks like now is towards the bottom here. But I also want to make a point that Plum, Plum Grove is also considered Greek revival. Um, so again, style within styles, there's a lot of variation. Gothic um, and uh, style is also um, common during uh, this time period until 1880. Um, really, Gothic houses are really noted for having that kind of distinctive window with a peak at the top. This one I put in here specifically, this is the house on the corner of Dodge and College. Um, this is the difference not having a porch mix on your house. It totally changes the look of your house. It's exactly the same house, um, just a bit later in time. And it looks like a totally different house. Um, this is Italianate. This is also popular until the 1860s, but you see it later here in Iowa City. Both these houses are far after 1860. This is the close house or the close mansion. And then I, um, and this is um, the house that Sandy Eskin saved. This was going to become the spot of a, an apartment building, and it led to our first historic district in Iowa City. Um, Woodlawn. And you can see the difference. These are both considered Italianate, but they're very different houses. And uh, Queen Anne style houses. I have to point these out because I get out asked a lot about them. These are, um, I always say that it looks like someone took Victorian and shook it up and threw it back out. Um, but they're, they tend to be very ornate when you have, uh, but they can also be very, they can be less ornate with Queen, uh, Queen Anne features. And I had to throw that in there because I had that cartoon and I had to use it. So, And then also the American Foursquare. These became popular. There's a lot of these in Iowa City. Um, these were easy for people to build themselves. They also became popular about the time you could order you know, your Sears catalog house. Um, you could order entire houses online. They, um, are essentially four rooms on and usually a second story, though they don't have to have with another four rooms. So as you can see, those time periods can kind of give you an idea when your house was built. Um, but again, it's just an idea. It isn't um, absolutely true. And there are several other types of houses in Iowa City, but that's something I can really get carried away on. So I, I only put those in there. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if you'd like. I also wanted to uh, give a nod here to to molding and hardware and other features inside the house because those are also very distinctive. Um, 
again, just like anything else, cars or clothing styles, they change throughout time. These are uh, two pieces of hardware that are frequently found in Iowa City. They are both, um, they're called Salon. And they are, this one's from 1895 and this one's from 1905. Uh, um, so that can help you date a house. Keep in mind, someone can always use older hardware and someone can always, you know, replace their hardware later on. For actually looking up your property and records, um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Iowa City Assessor site. Um, the, this, uh, this is what is called often a hard card. This is what we had before the Iowa City Assessor site, and this gives you who owned the house and the sale price of the house and basic information. Um, I, I wanted to point out that now the Iowa, the Iowa City Assessor, if you go to the bottom right-hand corner of this page right here, you can click a link for the hard card. They're all online now, which has made my life a lot easier, but it, it, it's very helpful to know. And then also building permits and building cards. There weren't building permits very often uh, early on, but um, for changes or modifications to your house, or if your house was, say, built in the 40s and you want to find more out about it, or the 50s or the 60s, you can find this information with the city. Um, your building permit will often tell you the contractor who built it, um, kind of the cost, the scope, the materials, and then permit cards are often on file with the city and they'll tell you things like if an addition was put on, when the new roof was put on, that sort of thing, but they can help you find out details about the house. Now, someone might have already done the research on your house. <laughs> so I, I always tell people, um, you know, be aware if you're in a historic or conservation district, because if you are, someone did a survey on your house already, and a lot of the information you may be looking for is already in that, in that survey, and it can um, absolutely help you find, um, give you a launching place to find out more information. Um, site inventory forms are also done for any, any area affected um, by, say, natural disaster or something else that has received federal funds under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. It's required by law. So if um, something is adjacent to the campus or was affected during the flood that also affected the campus, you may be able to find a record of that building through a site inventory form. And uh, these are actually more frequently in Iowa now online. They didn't used to be, but they're, they're very easy to find online. Um, this is actually the site inventory form for the house we just moved over on uh, from Iowa Avenue to College. College Street. All right, and then books and periodicals. And this is a place where we're very lucky in Iowa City, but a lot of towns have these. And I'll bring up books a couple of times. If you live in a grander home in Iowa City, there's a very good chance. Um, this is its second. This is a second edition of the book. These are available widely at used bookstores. You can also still get them. Now you can order them from uh, the university um, press. Um, but these, this was a master's thesis she wrote, and it gives a description of different architectural styles and houses throughout Iowa City. Um, another thing that might help you find out more about your house, and these are all here at the library, is um, books like this. This is Small But Ours by Mary Beth Sloniger, and it really details the Czech and Slovak uh, neighborhood, Goose Town here in Iowa City. But people, when photographs were rare, people often had their photographs taken in front of their houses. Because, you know, if you're going to take pictures of things, but you, you know, same thing with cars. A lot of, a lot of photographs are taken with cars. Um, so sometimes these photos will be dated. You can see the house in the background, and you can go from there with that information. It, you can either see maybe that house was there then or it wasn't there yet. So those are also very, very good resources for finding out if your house was in, existed or had modifications, or um, even sometimes with books like Small But Ours, uh, books on neighborhoods or cities, you can also find out, um, you know, the development of the neighborhood. Maybe it won't say that your house was built in 1893, but the houses in the neighborhood seem to have been built right around that time. So again, it gives you a launching point. And most importantly, if you want to find out the most about your, peop uh, your, your, uh, your house, the best thing to do is follow the people. Um, you will find out more about your house by following the actual people instead of the house. 
And this is because um, everything leads back to someone's house eventually. You know, where you live is extremely important. So if you know the person who lived in your house, you can use what are called um, city directories. And we have a few out here, um, which um, the, that belong to the library. There's also several copies of the State Historical Society. These were put per out periodically throughout time um, by companies as a type of I guess the closest approximation we'd have is a telephone book, even before there were telephones. But it generally listed a person, what their occupation was, and where they lived. Um, really, before, um, I believe in Iowa City, the 1911 book, you're not going to find house numbers in any of these books. It will say they lived on the corner of Johnson and College. It will say uh, they lived in the middle of the block between, you know, Prentice and the railroad tracks. So they're very vague descriptions. Towns were small enough at that point, especially towns like Iowa City, where you could just ask someone in the neighborhood and once you got that far and they could help you out. But these are gonna um, let you know what was going on at that property and if your person lived at that property at that time. Newspapers are also a great resource. And for a very long time, we were very lucky in Iowa. Um, newspapers are really the diary of our our um, towns. They, they record everything that has happened. And for a long time, the State Historical Society of Iowa made sure that they got every single newspaper in Iowa, and then they went ahead and put them on microfiche. This practice, unfortunately, has ended. It really should start again. They have piles and piles of paper that they need, papers they need to put on microfiche, but um, the funding has not been available um, in, recent, in the last decade, I think. So, um, but if you go to the State Historical Society and you know someone's name, there's a chance if you just start looking through newspapers when the, you know, Iowa City had 4,000, 5,000 people, you'll actually just find them. But if you also know that, wow, I knew they were 90 in 1893, you also might want to start searching obituaries about that time. And obituaries will contain a lot of information, including who, who their parents were, who their children were, where they were from, uh, where their children might have gone. Uh, a lot of houses stay in families. So these really, really, really uh, can help you out. And I realize I didn't change the, oops, sorry about that. I didn't change the text up there when I did the slide, sorry. Um, and then um, books again. And these types of books, I put it here again, and periodicals as well. Um, there are books like this one, and I also have this up here. This is um, Dr. DeGowan's book about, it's a memoir about growing up in Iowa City. And if you live in a Moffat, particularly in the Lucas Farms neighborhood, and you want to know about your house, you need to get this book. It, it's about his life, but there are pictures of his neighborhood. There are pictures of different houses with people in front of them. And these types of books, though, you know, not about a particular house or not even about houses, oftentimes have information which will help lead to your house. Oral history is phenomenally important. Um, you will actually find when you move into a neighborhood, you might have a neighbor that's lived there for 50, 60 years. It's not uncommon. When I moved into my 1960s ranch, I know it's not quite as old as some people's houses here, I found both neighbors on both sides of me were original purchasers of their home. They can tell you everything that happened in that neighborhood. They can tell you everyone who lived there. They can tell you about you know, the naughty kid that lived there and the dog that wouldn't stop barking. They know everything. Um, and postal workers are another good source. If you have an older postman um, or postwoman, I should say, either or, um, they can tell you a lot about their neighborhood. They know where everybody lived in town, and oftentimes they know where they moved to. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I grew up in a, a smaller town than Iowa City, uh, not quite 30,000 people, and the postal workers did know where everybody went. I, I had a, a friend's father who worked for the post office, and he would tell me really things that came off to me at the time. It was kind of very creepy that he knew about people, but that's because his, his job was to know addresses. Um, and then former residents, if you know who lived in your house before you and you can find them, give them a call. You'll be surprised. Most people, especially if they grew up in the house, the, it was a very, very happy thing for them to grow up in that house. And they'll be more than happy to sit down and talk to you. Um, they can tell you a lot of things. They may also know what you're looking for, who lived there before you, uh, when things and changes happened to your house, when the house was built. So I, that, I really, really encourage people to do that if they're able to find out that information. 
and I'm ahead of my notes here. These things all lead you to photographs. And that's why I put these after this. When you start researching a property, funny things will happen. If you manage to bump into old neighbors uh, that have been there for 40 years, or you bump into find the person who lived there before, they're going to have photographs. And in those photographs, the house is often going to be in the back. And these are, are kind of two examples. Um, this one, actually, I had to put in because that's my grandma right there and my great grandma. But um, again, their house is very important, so it was in the background. This other uh, picture right here is the house we just moved from 422 Iowa, the Hauser Metzger house, to 623 College Street. And this came about because um, once kind of the information on the house move got out, uh, Rose Clark realized that she had a picture of this house because her grandfather is one of the workers up there on the house. So it's kind of these contacts that actually find you the pictures. That being said, we do have a phenomenal collection as well at the State Historical Society, so you should definitely um, see if you can find uh, information there. Again, with the restricted hours and restricted staff, it is harder to get to photographs now because they're usually in special collections. But um, this is kind of ultimately what people are in interested in is, is finding out what their house looked like, finding out how their house was built, finding out who lived there. And um, these are all very great resources to kind of get to this point. And then luck. Um, my last thing here I want to share is um, when you start researching, you just kind of never know what you're going to find. And this is back to 528 College, Kevin, uh, Kevin and Helen Burford's house. About a year ago, um, I was researching the parade of historic homes we had coming up. We have another one on um, May 29th coming up here uh, on Summit and Kirkwood Streets. I encourage you all to go. It's a great time. But a year ago, I was doing research in just the adjacent neighborhood, and this is actually, actually for a house on, on Kirkwood Street, Governor Kirkwood's house, um, and, or excuse me, Kirkwood Avenue. And I was just reading a, a very interesting biography um, by John Clark, and um, going around, taking my notes, not thinking much about it, and I got to this passage in the book. Now, when uh, Governor Kirkwood um, died, his widow, Jane, lived for a considerably long time. She was a bit younger and she lived to be 99. So there are a couple different biographies written where she is the primary source of those on her husband. Um, and I'm reading along and I see her say, well, when we came to Iowa City, we stayed with my brother John Clark on the corner of College and Johnson Streets. And I knew that Helen had been trying forever to find out more about her house. She knew all about the brick house that was built around it. She had dates. Her husband used to work at the State Historical Society. You know, Helen had my job before me. She knew exactly what she was doing, but she got to the sticking point where she couldn't find out anything about the stone house inside her house. Um, well, I knew, as Helen did, there were only ever three houses on college and on College and Johnson Street. The fourth corner has always been, since the city was originally uh, conceived of, been College Green Park. There was never a house built there. So that meant one of these three corners left was one of these houses. Now the house could have been torn down and the newer houses on the other two corners could have built there. But I was able to give this information to Helen, who was able then to go to the county courthouse with the name of John Clark, who owned the house. She looked in that record of deeds book and she was able to trace the, uh, the original stone house back to 1842 or 1843. Now remember, Iowa City was founded in 1839. This is one of the oldest houses, if not the oldest, really in Iowa City. Granted, it's in another house. Um, but she also found out that it was built by Beaumont Holmes, who was a marble cutter. Uh, and he had a business on the corner of Kirkwood, excuse me, on Clinton and Court Streets. And um, he also probably made tombstones. He is buried in Oakland Cemetery. So I guess my point with that is you never know like where research is going to lead you. If you're it's, it's incredible what you find out by accident. And if you're researching your house, little happy accidents will happen like this, where it may pertain to your, your own house, but it also may pertain to your neighbor's house. Um, but F Helen was able to complete the story of her house, finally found out the person who built the first house on that lot that is part of her house. It's, it's a beautiful stone house. And, um, 
and really complete the story of her house. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, now ask your question. Uh, how do you research the land itself? The land itself? Um, that's that is, uh, to, to, to determine what was once there maybe 100 years ago and whether it could be dangerous to health uh, now. I remember a few years mm -hmm. back, uh, Iowa City ran into a problem. There was a property south of Burlington there about that first creek. Uh, heading heading east, and in Burlington had the same thing mm -hmm. uh, when they built their bridge. They found coal tar, mm -hmm. which is a known carcinogen, but nobody remembered there was a coal gasification plant there. Yeah, well, that um, unfortunately, when they do new construction, that is oftentimes when they remember things were there. Um, with larger industrial projects, which oftentimes cause the pollution, um, you, this, you can pretty much do the same thing as a house search. You can go back and look at those Sanborn maps. You can go look at tax records and you can see what's there. Um, you're not going to be able to know necessarily how polluted it is, but you can tell by the type of industry what, which was there whether or not it is likely to have been polluted or has a higher chance of being, being polluted. Um, this is actually now that um, this is actually kind of a common problem in, in, in larger cities that had huge industrial bases that don't anymore. They're running into this a lot, and oftentimes they discover it when they go to dig. One of the things um, that I brought in in the center of the table up there is the abstract from my house. And the reason I brought it is the first entry was made when Iowa was still a territory. And it's when a man bought 80 acres from the United States government mm -hmm. that was then platted and became an addition to Iowa City, north of town. But the original plat map is in the very back. And the sale is the very first thing in my abstract. And it's interesting to look at. So you're welcome to take a look at it. And that was in my notes that I didn't mention. When you go back in the Record of Deeds books at the uh, either at a courthouse or a, a county building that houses those books, you tra in Iowa, you will trace back the property until it says something like US government or something, something like that. And, and that's, that would be considered legally the original property owner. Obviously, people were living there beforehand. Um, but that is the earliest entry you will find. I wanted to, to point out a couple other things that you can find at the library. So if you're trying to trace the person, which I think is a, a, a great tip that you're giving, Alicia, is that census records can, oh, can, right. I just <laughs> left out census records. can tell you a tremendous amount about who lived where. And so if you know the person, it will also tell you, this, depending on what, what decade it was mm -hmm. done, where that person lived and the house number of that person. And Beth, you had an interesting story about house numbers. And house numbers can change as well. Mm -hmm. they're, not a, they're not static. They can be renamed and renumbered. But a census record can tell you a tremendous amount, particularly if you're then trying to figure out when a person died. So if they stayed in Iowa City or stayed in Iowa and they were in the, 19, the 1850 census, but they weren't in the 1860 census, and there's a widow mm -hmm. listed and no, no um, house that had head of the household, that person's probably died. So finding the obituary can be a bit of a trial. We have a resource at the library now called Newspaper Archive, and a good number of the newspapers, early Iowa City newspapers, and some of the more contemporary press citizens have been, the microfilm has been scanned. And so you can do a, a word search, and so you can put a person's name in, and if that newspaper happened to have been scanned, you can find it without having to read through on microfilm, which can be a challenge. Another fantastic resource is the Daily Iowan. Every single issue of the Daily Iowan is available to search online through the University of Iowa. Granted, it's a, a newspaper for the University of Iowa, but there's still a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of information in there. And Iowa City is so closely woven into the university that you can find a lot of history by looking at those old Daily Iowans. And you can look at those anytime you want. You don't have to go to the State Historical Society. You can look at them at home. So there's a lot of good 
information that you can find online that you might not be aware of. Um, Ancestry, which is the mm -hmm. genealogical resource we have, you have to use in-house or you can you know, get a two-week trial subscription and stay up for 24 hours straight for two weeks <laughs> in research, but they continually add more and more mm -hmm. to it. But that mm -hmm. census information is really valuable mm -hmm. if you're trying to find things about people and, and, and yeah. genealogical societies. Yeah, and I, I apologize for the census data. I should have mentioned that. It wasn't my list of things to put in. I think I wanted to condense it down into 45 minutes, and I think I might have. Oh, no, it was a great presentation. It was <laughs> this is maybe a question for you, Maeve. Um, so before phone books, there were business directories, and this would relate to your hazardous materials question. How far back did the business directories for Iowa City go? What is your start date for those? The city? I was going to mention that, too. Um, what he's talking about, we have both business directories and we have city directories. The city directories are more common, and they're the ones that Alicia mentioned. They're kind of like a phone book. We have one that predates... Um, 1900, and then we jump to like 1902, 1909, 1911. But starting in 1911, they added a feature that's absolutely fabulous. You have the first half of the book is people by name. Then the second half are the streets. But it's everyone who lived on the street and their address. So it'll say Dewey Street, which is my street, from Brown to the railroad track and it will list everyone who lives on that street and their house address. And that started in 1911. Anytime before that, all you're going to have is names and it'll tell you their address, but it's in name order only. But these are great also because there's all sorts of other information in them. Ads for businesses, lists of types of businesses. If you want to know who the mortician was or who the stagecoach builder was or who the dentists were, they're listed in here because this was a prime source of advertising. Um, these are generically referred to as city directories or polk directories um, and they are at the page station upstairs. We don't circulate them out of the building but you can trade your ID for one, use it here in the building and then when you need the next one you go switch. But they're a great source of information, especially depending on how far back your house is. I mean, my house is older than 1911, so I'm sort of out of luck until 1911. But if your house was built after 1911, you can look at your street and how ch things change. Hold on just a second. We have a page on our website that if you put in local history, you'll get where we've tried to pull together all our local history resources, and we probably have missed some because they, we keep adding to them. But we have a, a microfilm reel of the city directories, which we don't have, and some of the more fragile ones. And there's a directory that dates back to 1857. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very early and it's very small because 1857, mm -hmm. there wasn't a whole lot here. And the information isn't, isn't as detailed, but I think there are ads in that one as well. And so you can get a very interesting picture. And that's another, this is maybe a little bit off track of finding the history of your house, but another thing in looking at old newspapers, when you're looking at the full page of the newspaper, you can see the ads. And that might give you information about the building materials mm -hmm. as well. Because, yeah. And you have to remember, in 1900, Iowa City only had 5,000 people. So it's a considerable, I have sat with those city directories without house numbers or streets and gone back and just looked for someone's name. And you do get there eventually, it's a little tedious. Um, but, um, you know, you, there, you're talking about a much smaller amount of people, so it is possible to find things that way. Also with newspapers, when you only have 5,000 people, everybody ends up on the, in the newspaper for good or bad at some point. Um, I've actually found people's houses as advertisements for builders in town when I'm going, whoa, whoa, wait, that's Mark's house, you well, know, and, and it, when I wasn't even looking for them. And, and back to Irving Weber, who, if you recall the, the um, Margaret Keyes book, Irving Weber wrote the introduction to that. And Irving Weber wrote about living in Iowa City. He lived on Iowa Avenue, first of all, and then he ended up, his last home was in University Heights. And so he wrote a lot of somewhat suspect, but oftentimes <laughs> true from his memory of, of what it was like to live in Iowa City. And he spent a lot, he delivered newspapers, he had a, a dairy business, he knew a lot about the homes. And so that's a really good resource in, in Iowa City as well. And those are all the University of Iowa because they've digitized the, not only the, mm -hmm. the books, but all of the articles. Mm -hmm. They're a wonderful resource that you can search online. Oh, this is the city directory. Today. Well, they still make them, they still make them but 
once a year. They're, they're, they're done once a year, and they're, unfortunately, they're using, losing a lot of their, we're losing a lot of our, our connections to where people are because they don't have landlines anymore. Yeah. And so phone books, phone books are, we also have a great collection of phone books at the library, and we have a collection of herd books, which are the University of Iowa's directory. And so there were people who lived in Iowa City for a good period of time and then moved away <coughs> as their college career ended. But the city directories have gotten smaller in a lot of ways because they don't have that section for phone numbers any longer. And they're out of, they're always out of date when they're published unless somebody hasn't moved for a long time because it's at least a year old. So we have an, we keep our city directories and the, Un, the State Historical Society has a fantastic collection of city directories from all over the, the state and Ancestry keeps adding to its city directory collection. So if you haven't used Ancestry and you're trying to do some kinds of research, you might be amazed at what you can find on there. Uh, speaking from uh, my background in the landscape world and kind of to speaking to your question, in Iowa we have aerial photographs that go back to the 1930s, which is always a great thing to just look at. I'm sure you guys have found those online, but those are often ways that you can kind of tell from a landscape, landscape perspective because those weren't really detailed in, in materials or, or where the trees were located or anything, but that can give you an idea of, of what you're looking at from at least the 30s. Yeah, there's a, a good, actually there's several good books on, on buildings. There's a, there's a couple books just about Sears houses mm -hmm. that have Sears catalog. There's a lot of Sears houses in Iowa City. Um, and uh, there's some others, I think, um, what's, there's another company that made houses too, but there's a book sure, yeah. about that too, yeah. So th those are really helpful too, because uh, you often see a bunch of them in one neighborhood and uh, mm -hmm. you can figure out when, the, when they're available for sale basically, so you can kind of get a good idea when your house is built within about a five-year period when the models are available. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I um, better turn off my mic now. Um, <clears throat> is my mic on? Okay. Um, leading events of Johnson County, um, there's two volumes to it, actually. This is a phenomenal resource, um, and it is basically a who's who book of things that happened in Johnson County. Only when they talk about the person, they show you the house. And that's another one of those local resource books that I was talking about. This is available online. I actually believe the New York Public Library put it online. I have no idea why. Google Books. Google Books is <clears throat> and um, so you can, there's just beautiful pictures of people's houses as well sometimes as the pictures of the people. Sometimes, a lot of them in here, there's just pictures of the houses and no people. But I think, you know, when you're talking about who's who, it was, you know, who had the bigger house. So, um, but this is just a wonderful resource. There's a copy here at the library. There's a copy of the State Historical Society, and then you can view it online. Um, again, if you live in a bigger house, a very early house, th this book will be very helpful. Um, for people who live in smaller houses um, where the people weren't as wealthy, your houses are going to be much, much harder to, to track down. Um, it's still possible, but, you know, they didn't end up in the who's who's book usually, so. Irving Weber used to be uh, my neighbor, and I used to go sit on his porch and talk with him. I was just wondering, I never ended up buying the collection of books and I would like to do so, where can I get those at? Go to a used bookstore. Or a garage sale. Or a garage sale. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. At where? At the used bookstores, A-E-E -E books. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I believe, I know when I was You'll in the You'll be lucky to find a whole year. set. You'll probably find them one volume at a time. <clears throat> yeah, but yeah, they're still available around. I bought a whole set for our organization um, because we kept, using them as resources and I I believe I got them all at defunct books at the time and they had all of them um, actually they had a lot of them I, I went up to the counter and I said do you have Irving Weather's books and he was like yes you know <laughs> he had so many copies so they are around well thank you very much for this presentation and we have another like, we're doing some um, classes on scanning photographs we have someone in here who took the class yesterday, and so we've got that as far as historic preservation, but next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Tom Schulein, who's a retired dental faculty member, is going to give us a 
present a program on the history of Iowa City street names, which oh. I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated with Iowa City street names and why is St. Clements Alley named St. Clements Alley and all sorts of things and streets have changed names. So if you're interested in that aspect of Iowa City history, I encourage you to come back. But thank you very much, Alicia. This was a great program.